everybody. Welcome back to The Human Perspective. Today, we're trying something new, and uh, I hope it works out. Um, I've had the privilege over the last number of months to get to meet Marley Matlin and um, Chella Mann and Alexis Kasher and our great interpreter, plus plus, Jack Jason. And what we're going to do today is have a kind of an open discussion about issues around uh, the importance of access to religious life for those people who are interested in participating, uh, barriers and successes that we've had. So I'd like to start off first. Uh, my name is Judy Human, and we are in the foyer of my house. I am wearing a, brat, a bright pink sweater. Um, I have a necklace on with a Jewish star and I'm also wearing a menorah, uh, which is for a holiday called Hanukkah, which is celebrated in December. And I am uh, behind me, I have various uh, pictures on the wall of family. So I'm gonna go around now and have each one of us introduce ourselves and I'd like to start off with Marley, Marley Matlin. Hi, thank you, Judy. Hi, I'm Marley Matlin, and I'm here in California, in Los Angeles, um, which has better weather than every place else left in the country. And well, sort of, uh, depends on the time of year. And I'm wearing a black sweater with silver sprinkles in the sweater. It's kind of like a the candles on your menorah. And behind me in the background are a lot of different things, little trinkets. Uh, but one of the big trinkets back there, I would say, is my Academy Award, the Oscar behind me, uh, a Golden Globe Award, and beautiful uh, yellow roses to my behind me to my left. I have my most precious trinket is a painting that was done by one of my four kids behind me on the wall. It's a large painting covered in glass of the entire outline of my five-year-old when she was five years old, painted and representing themselves when they were five. And in fact, I have three other children and each one of them has done the same sort of painting. And are they hanging up all around the house? Yes, they are. They are. They're all over everywhere, all over the, the family room. Great idea. Alexis, you wanna go next? Hi, I'm Alexis Kasher and I am here in New York and uh, where the weather is absolutely gorgeous today. Uh, it must be like 70 degrees and I was able to sit outside all day today. Uh, I am in my basement office I have a bookshelf behind me to my right, actually on both sides. Uh, behind me is a wall with various framed uh, paper items uh, from different universities. And uh, Marley says many, many, many. And pictures of my kids on the bookshelf shelves. And there are some books, some uh, basketball, uh, what can I say that, memorabilia, a big fan and also some other photographs. And it's exciting. it's exciting to be here with all of you here today and it's an honor. And thank you very much, Judy, for having and including me. Marley's the only one who's gonna be showing a golden globe and an academy, at least thus far. And how many children do you have, Alexis? I have three, I have three. Um, I have one 18 year old, a 21 year old, and a 23 year old. Two of them are in New York and one is in Virginia for college. And then the second one is actually at, at, at NYU. Um, so uh, both locally and one already working. Thank you. Nella. My name is Hi. Man Chella. Um, I am a artist who identifies as deaf, trans, gender, queer, Jewish, and Chinese. Um, I'm wearing tan shirt with Jewish star of David. 
um, and behind me is a painting that I made, which is really colorful. And it has like a person sitting on a bench with a like, green monster behind them and two hands holding a cell phone. And it's called, do you want to be liked or do you want to start a revolution? And I'm also excited to be here with you all today. And Alexis, sorry, could you just give us a little bit of information about you? I, yeah, I just realized that I didn't describe, I forgot to describe what I'm wearing. I have a white blouse, a bu white button shirt uh, with two pockets and two front pockets and a gray tank top underneath that you can see just briefly through the, through the blouse um, part, part, partly. Uh, I have curly longish shoulder length wavy hair that's put up in the back and a, a sort of a half ponytail. And um, I have glasses and uh, I just have lots of accoutrements on myself. <laughs> uh, what kind of jewelry do you have, Alexis? Yes, I have my I love you jewelry uh, that I, I wear every day. It's the symbol for I love you that I made through my company. And uh, that's it. It's what is the name of it? It's called Rose by Ander. Marley asked, what is it? Thank you, Marley, for promoting. That's the name of it. Uh, wait a minute. Wait, and then, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> They're all talking at the same time. I'm like, <laughs> So when we decided we wanted to do this program, um, basically December, which is when this program is airing, is a time for many different celebrations. Kwanzaa, Christmas, Hanukkah, and it happens to be that the four of us are Jewish. And so we started talking about the importance of being able to participate in religious communities and some of the barriers that we've faced and changes that we've been able to advance. So um, Alexis, would you mind uh, starting to talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing to advance um, inclusion of deaf people into the Jewish community. Sure. Um, it's a long story, but I'll try to start someplace. Uh, I grew up uh, deaf. Um, I had deaf parents. And the access for me was a little bit different than others. We didn't go to a temple, per se. We didn't really celebrate formally the Jewish holidays, like a lot of people in the Jewish deaf communities might have done. We were mostly at home, uh, which meant that if, for example, we're talking about Hanukkah or Passover, um, it was more or less uh, understood. I mean, we understood the basics of it. We got presents, we celebrated the traditions, whatever it may be, the holidays themselves. Um, and then fast forward a few years later when I had my own family, and I realized that I was now the one responsible for sharing the traditions of the holidays and teaching those to my kids. And that included religious traditions uh, and access to and understand and help me understand what's going on in terms of myself, because personally, I didn't know enough. So my uh, journey in picking up and understanding and learning about access uh, without having access for myself growing up, I needed to develop that. I, I needed to be able to share with them, to give to them what other Jewish families typically do. So that was my new job. So I needed to fight for access for myself and to be able to get them what they needed in terms of traditions to understand the Jewish community, which is not that accessible or wasn't that accessible at the time. Um, the problem was twofold wasn't familiar with, they weren't familiar with the use of interpreters. And secondly, the second problem was there was a language barrier. And there's a lot of Hebrew that goes on in Jewish celebrations. And of course, to use an interpreter, you find that barrier. My oldest daughter, for example, um, when she was getting close to being about mitzvah age, that's when I got very, um, I guess, serious and proactive about gaining access to the uh, various intricacies of how uh, the Jewish community works. So the first time that I ever celebrated in a synagogue with my entire family with full accessible services was when I was 43 years old. And it took that long for us to be able to really benefit 
from what the community had to offer. So that's just my life in, in, in brief, uh, my journey uh, through Judaism. How many of your children are deaf? None of them are deaf, none of them are deaf. They're all hearing. So they're all hearing. My, my point is, is that they didn't get anything if I hadn't been able to get something. So I needed to gain access first. And it's not only deaf people that it affected, it affected the whole family too, whether they were deaf or hearing. It was just a matter of, uh, you know, there it, it was a big barrier to overcome. I think it's a very powerful story. Yeah. Um, and you are an activist as are all of you, all of us. And so your activism really made changes occur. Maybe we can get back to that a little bit later. Uh, Chella, um, so you wanna to talk to us a little bit about issues around access uh, for you into um, the religious community. And I think as Alexis was saying, we all practice differently. Some people participate in uh, synagogues, some people don't. Some people like Alexa was also saying, maybe celebrating holidays like Hanukkah and Passover, which are frequently in the home. Um, so what has been your experience and your desire? Good question. Um, my mom is Jewish. So growing up, I was always going to synagogue. Uh, I don't know how to spell it. It's synagogue. synagogue, it's like that, synagogue. synagogue. Synagogue, I was always going to the synagogue. So for eight years, I would go. And I had, at the time we called it bought mitzvah. But now I think there's really a non-binary word for having like a bought mitzvah. So I would use that, but at the time I had that. It was a lot of work. I don't think a lot of people really understand how much work you have to put into it. Like learning the, I'm not sure how to spell this too, Huff Torah um, and you know, Huff, Huff Torah and, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and studying just like everything that you need to for the service and only then you get the party. <laughs> and I feel like most people only know the party part. Um, but yeah, so growing up, I right. always learned a lot about that. And, you know, I was talking to you early, or earlier about how you really learn about uh, the Holocaust, Holocaust at a really young age. And I feel like learning that story and understanding how extreme people can become was really eye-opening for me and I always knew that you had to stick up for yourself and your beliefs because of that. And also I feel like Judaism really always taught, taught me how to question everything. Jews have so many questions and I love that. And I do too. So growing up, you know, you're just always questioning things. So I feel like that's part of my experience being Jewish too. Um, and now, that I'm in New York, I'm trying actually to find a synagogue. So I was gonna ask Alexis where you go for your synagogue because it's probably really amazing and, and accessible. And I've never really went to a service that has like a good interpreter. And you live in Brooklyn now. Brooklyn, yeah, I live. And Alexis is in Manhattan. Uh, Alexis, maybe you can give him a, a referral later. No, Jack is frozen a little bit. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, Jack said, maybe you can tell me where you go to synagogue in Manhattan, you live? Oh, I'm happy I can. Um, so it's uh, Scarsdale is where I live. And we have an amazing synagogue here, an amazing rabbi who really started uh, with, if the rabbi is, is amenable to wanting to make a difference, then um, it, it turns out to be a wonderful situation. Um, is, it's a reform synagogue, 
and I'd be happy to discuss with you about it and why and what they do uh, correctly. We'll connect with you. Thank you. Yes, you so got Harley, it. Uh, what have been your experiences regarding accessibility? So um, my experience uh, in synagogue is different than both Chella and Alexis's experience. Um, it just so happened that it turned out this way that I was born and raised in Chicago. And I was very, very fortunate to have the opportunity as well as the accessibility into the Jewish community as a young girl of seven. I went to a synagogue that the rabbi was able to sign fluently, fluently. He was a hearing rabbi. And I remember going at seven and being amazed at the fact that here is a temple where the rabbi signed and there were deaf children and hearing children, all of whom signed. And maybe perhaps some of them didn't, but there was the, the entire spectrum of the deaf community was represented in this synagogue. And I loved it and I loved going. And it wasn't necessarily because of all the the sermons and the stories and the Bible, um, because I was so young, but it was because for me, it was the social interaction. It was in my language. And that's why I loved going to temple every Friday night in particular for Shabbat on Sundays for Sunday school. I would look forward each Sunday. I mean, I began then to learn and read and speak Hebrew for my bat mitzvah. And I loved, I loved it because I knew that it was viewed as unusual for a deaf girl to speak Hebrew, not necessarily sign Hebrew, but I, I only wish I could, I wish I could sign Hebrew back then, but I know there is sign language for, for Hebrew, but I don't know how to do it myself. But I, I was so proud of on my bat mitzvah day, and I'll never forget that day where I was reading my haftarah and I had my portion ready and spoke it in the Hebrew and looking up and seeing all my family and my friends and everyone. But the most interesting thing is that everybody was crying. And when I looked up, I said, they were crying. And I thought, what, what, something must be wrong. I must've said something wrong. But because they were crying, I began to cry too. And because, you know, when they cry, I cry. I mean, I'm just that way. Yeah. And then what I realized is that I had stained the parchment with my tears. And I began to cry even more because I was so horrified. When I was done, I went up to the rabbi and I said, Rabbi, I'm so, so sorry. I ruined the Torah with my tears. And he said, so wisely, he said, no, Marley, you did not. Those tears are, are tears of joy. And they are a representation of, and a recognition of the importance of you in the Jewish community as a member of the Jewish community. And of course, I was very relieved to hear that. I mean, I couldn't be more proud as a member of the Jewish community back then as I am now. And those Friday nights, the Shabbat the celebrations were uh, just so special. I was fortunate to have 100% access to temple growing up. And one thing I didn't have access to was, although we had family celebrations and every Jewish holiday, we gathered together for whether it was Hanukkah or Passover or Yom Kippur, any of those holidays, uh, even Purim, the, the problem was that everybody was hearing. So there was no conversing in sign language. I didn't have that access at home to be able to have in-depth discussions about the religious practices themselves. And that's one thing that I regret, but I still love to this day, family gatherings. And I think that's important to me. And everyone there is a part of, you know, is an important thing for me in terms of a Jewish holiday. I, I guess at the time it was sufficient for me. Now I'm married to a Catholic and we have four children. And I have to say that I did not 
practice my Judaism with my kids. Um, and it's a long story, uh, and I don't want to, to belabor you with my guilt, but uh, I hope that when my kids become adults and practice religion on their own, that they'll choose to practice Judaism uh, in their way. We've got to play Hanukkah, we've got to play Christmas, we've got to play um, everything together. And so that makes me happy. I guess um, having a family together is important to me. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what we listen, we're celebrating. I'm very festive. Mm -hmm. But you see now, Alexi, no, I'm very festive. But I think it's important to acknowledge Judaism and mm -hmm. where and what we've been through. My family in the Holocaust. Um, we must acknowledge it to the max. Mm -hmm. And I don't forget, I'm Jewish. And I, I always be Jewish. And I'm proud to be Jewish. So. No, I was um, only going to say that my experience is different. I'm hearing. I use the wheelchair. And many, many places, synagogues, are not accessible. So for me, um, being carried by my father um, when I was a child always happened. And I'm much older than all of you. So I did not have a bat mitzvah. I was a part of a confirmation. And my father had to pull the wheelchair up the steps. So I think these stories are very important because we're sharing our experiences. And I wanted to say to the audience, while today, you know, we're all Jewish, um, people who are Catholic or Muslim or whatever your faith may be, we always have stories around accessibility. And I think the importance of this discussion today is for us, our religion is meaningful in part because it brings family together. It's a unifying time. And uh, we're going to be airing this program in December. And so we are knowing that many of you who will be watching this We'll be celebrating the days that you celebrate and hope that a part of what you will be able to do is discuss the importance of accessibility and uh, use the stories um, that Alexis and Shella and Marley and myself have shared as examples access to religious life or anything is not just our responsibility as disabled people. It is also the responsibility of our communities to be able to show not just that we benefit from being a part of the broader community but that the broader community overall benefits from inclusion. I agree. <laughs> so I'd like. Um, right. And like Shala, did you know where to find a temple that will have an interpreter? He should ask Alexi, who is able to assist him. Mm -hmm. So everybody needs to communicate with each other and find out where or what or how. So keep an open communication to find where you want to go, or what do you want to get, or what do you want to learn. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Starts with a good attitude. Starts with the rabbi. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, I forgot to mention that when I was younger, I was so lucky my rabbi was gay and and I 
Uh, it was shocking because I grew up in central Pennsylvania, which is a really conservative like town. And so I really never had to question my queerness and my Jewishness, which is a huge, huge privilege. Yeah. It is our responsibility to yes. help others. Yes. To have that excess. Well, and, guys. Um, religion is, isn't always necessary because I was thinking about how Marley, you were talking about, you don't like teach it to your kids, but you still have these family gatherings. And I think that's what's so you know, the most important that you have that connection and those relationships with them, like regardless, that still exists. And to be able to make choices. Yeah, be able to make choices. choices. So we're gonna stop now. Um, I wanna thank everyone. We could continue for a long time with this wonderful discussion, yeah. but, um, Maybe we'll be able to continue it in the future. I want to thank everyone here and all of the people that are watching and listening. And um, yeah, and we put it together. Won't forget us or try to minimize our pain. And so I wait.